How did my consulting offer start? I, I imagine it started with you helping people already. You, you don't just decide to launch a business without having some experience helping people break into consulting. Absolutely. So it started in a couple of ways. So when I was when I was at Bain, one of the things I, I loved was that Bain had such a culture that was very similar to college, which is that you have extracurriculars, we call them extra 10. So what's the extra 10% you're giving to the firm? And for me, my, my nickname was extra 40, because I would like work on the weekends on on different extracurriculars, the poker club, the learning club, the the outings club, the social impact club, and so forth. But the one that I spent a lot of time on disproportionately was the hiring and recruiting team. And so I would volunteer to read and go through resumes, mock interviews, whatever it was that they needed me to do in order to continue to build on the next generation of Bainies. And it's all started because if you remember, I had three weeks to figure all this out. So I was just curious what the other side looked like. And plus for me, I knew immediately after just the first couple of months at Bain that my life was going to be changed. So I wanted to be able to provide that opportunity for other people. And so I just did it because I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people on the recruiting team. So I did that for my entire time. So one of the jokes was that on my last day at Bain, there was a group of students coming in who were high potential. They, we, the firm wanted them to interview. And so they needed someone to give a tour of the office and take these people to lunch. So I immediately volunteered. And then so I gave them a tour from 12 p.m. all the way to 5 p.m. So we went through one of the events. And then at the end of it, they're like, Davis, you, one of the, one of the people who toured and would be an intern the following summer said, Davis, you seem to really love Bain. You took the last five hours to show us all the great things. So how long do you plan on being at Bain? And I said, well, looking at this clock, I was unemployed as of five minutes ago. So that was how much I enjoyed the recruiting process at Bain and just being able to help people with, with the designing of consulting is for them. And so I carried that with me when I went to Jump Cut. So as I mentioned, when Jump Cut first started, when I first started at Jump Cut, we weren't profitable yet. We were our goal was to get profitability. And so as a result, when I left, I, I took a 40% pay cut, but I was still living in California and I was supporting, I've been supporting my mom financially since I was 13. And so uh, all the equations did not add up. Taking a 40% cut while still paying California taxes and everything does not make sense in terms of supporting your mom. And so I needed something to do on the weekends. And for a number of years, I was on I was on Reddit for many reasons, but during Bain, I just loved answering Q and A when I was on when I Bain on on Reddit and other forums. And I just started continuing doing it, created a new username, kept doing it, and then a bunch of people just started messaging me and said, "Hey Davis, now that you're not at Bain, would you?" Or they didn't say Davis; they said my username. But they said, I, I, "Would you consider coaching?" And I thought, well, "Maybe this is a thing. Let's get on a call and see." And then so. I started building the business out that way. And it was just, this is back in 2017. So at this point, I've already helped people go through, but it was just more of now it's like formalized and I'm just helping people get into consulting, both on their resume, working on their interview skills. And this was a way for me to support my family, which the catalyst of all this and why I sped it for was that one of my family members had to go to emergency, emergency surgery and the bill was about $22,000. And so I needed to figure a way to fund the 22000 As in, you know how that whole works in the U.S. with the healthcare system. It's just, we're, we're not the best. And that was the issue. And I just needed this $22,000 debt cleared up. And that's how my consulting offer, which at the time didn't even have a name, didn't have a team. I didn't have the robust system I did now. And it was just Davis on the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, helping people with case interviews and helping them with their resumes. And eventually I was getting this 100% success rate with all these firms. And I was like, wow, maybe I'm onto something. And I just loved it. I did that for a year as a, just a side business on the weekends. And eventually, my one of my fellow family members suffered two strokes in a very short period of time. So I was like, time is limited. And so I was in California. They're back in Georgia. So I made the change that, well, I guess I would want to be able to be closer to my family. And so I quit Jump Cut on really good terms. I gave him like a three-month notice. might have been four-month notice. But it was just, and still stay in touch. But I said, I want to build this out and see where my consulting offer can go. And so I went from part-time to full-time to where we are now, where we have full curriculum, full coaches, full-time team members and so forth from McKinsey Bay and BCG. And that's why I decided to make full-time was I just wanted to spend more time with my family, which looking back when I was at Bain, I didn't get a chance to do because you're so away from your family. And I was already mm-hmm. on the West Coast when my family was on the East Coast. It was just like a life decision to be able to spend more time with my family, but also financially be able to support them, 
but also third, being able to continue doing what I love, which is how do I improve the lives of other people? That's such a common theme of a lot of people building internet businesses now is that they started out just like helping people for free. My story started on Quora. You, you probably, we, I'm sure we stumbled across each other's posts. Like I have all these posts dating a decade back, just helping people think about consulting. Um, and I just like writing about these things. I loved helping the underdogs too. I loved helping the people from the non-target schools. Uh, no, no offense to the Yaleys, but I, I probably would have been excited to help you just because of your <laughs> background. Um, but it's really helping people understand all the stuff I didn't know until I arrived at McKinsey. I got very lucky. Uh, I found like the perfect job and like really lucked out in my interviews. But when I got in there, I'm like, oh my God, I knew way less than everyone else. <laughs> um, so what what are some of the things that somebody thinking about consulting, maybe they have a surface level of understanding. What do they not understand about what it's like on the recruiting side of these consulting firms? Absolutely. Happy to answer that question and the process. But the first question I always ask people before you think about consulting is, again, the why question is, why do you want to get into consulting? And really, there's a whole presentation that I, I could say anyone who, who wants it is, I think the why is the most important because the recruiting process is going to take a lot of time and it's mentally just a commitment you have to make. So I want to make sure that people are going going it for the right reasons. So again, like I mentioned, it's like if you're willing to work hard, you want to learn, you want to be mentored and you're willing to put your ego aside, it's great. But if you're looking for a steady nine to five, I get to go home, have dinner at the same time. I All my performance reviews are great. I don't have anything to work on and I don't need to feel, feel worried that I don't know how to convince this person to take this action, then if that's for you, that's like consulting is not it. But if it is consulting is for you, then you start the process. The good news is that at a very high level, getting into consulting is very simple at a high level. It is get the interview and then second pass the interview. It's the process within it that takes a little bit more. And so the good news is, and you've done this beautifully on the channel as well as on your core post and everything else is that before, 20 years ago, yes, you needed a Harvard degree, you needed an MIT degree to be able to get in. But as firms grow, they realize three things. One is that diversity of experiences impacts in a positive way. Second is that not all the best talents went to Yale. They went to UConn, they went to other schools, they went to Simon School of Business and so forth. So they have this expansion. And third is because everything, especially after last year with 2020 is because you, a lot of the interviews can be done digitally. The range is a lot more than it was before because if you imagine like in the 90s when internet was very few and recruiters had a budget and they can only fly to a certain campuses and you had a choice between flying to University of Florida versus flying to Duke, it's kind of like you take your odds there. I'm not saying anything's wrong with University of Florida. It's like, it's just back then it was not an even playing field, but now it's even more of a playing field. But the con is that there are more people applying record highs every single year, people applying to consulting, even though the industry is growing, the percentage goes down because there's more people applying than the growth of spots that are opening. But once you get in, there's a couple of things that you need to know, which is I always ask these questions. Like if I had to summarize the best ways to get the interview and pass the interview, it comes out of these two sentences. When it comes to getting the interview, it's what value can you add to the firm? So, so many people. They write their resume about them. It's me, 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 me. Yeah, really, yeah. go back That's to the biggest mistake. Exactly. Versus, and you talked about this in your resume and cover letter video. It's like flip it around. It's like think about what does the firms want, and how can you make sure that they know it. That's pretty much the methodology that we teach. Obviously, it's more detail into the resume and cover letter, but it's at a very high level. It's figuring out, thinking about how to be a consultant before you get the job. Is a consultant is all about adding value to client, putting them first. Well, the consulting firms that you're applying to are your clients in this situation. So how do you show them that you can provide the skills or have the potential to? Because you don't need a perfect GPA. You don't need to come from a Harvard. You don't need to have the perfect background. But what you need to be able to do is communicate the value that you add. As in, if you don't take my word for it, you can literally go to our reviews page. And there are people who were former musicians. We had a bartender. We had flight attendants. We had salespeople. We have so many people coming from these odd backgrounds and non-traditional backgrounds. And they're able to get into consulting. So if a musician 
and a bartender can get into consulting, I am convinced. We also had a wedding <laughs> photographer as well get into consulting. I am convinced awesome. that most people can. And when it comes to getting the interview, or after you get the interview, the passing the interview part, it really comes down to knowing how to think like a consultant. So, so many people, they they'll read books, they'll pick up a book, they'll read it, they'll memorize what questions, but really you're not being tested on can you memorize facts and figures. It's really, how do you like to think like a consultant? And that's pretty much the methodology that we teach is how do you think like a consultant? And luckily for you is like, we've done it in less than a week, as in if you approach it as, okay, how do I cram these answers in? You're going to fail because one, the interview sees through that, but also second, and I'm worried about this always, is this is why I don't encourage memorization in our program is that once you start the job, yes, I get you the job, but I want you to succeed. I don't want you six months later to get fired because you, you couldn't think on your own. And that's the whole process of learning how to think like a consultant. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting process. I was actually not very good at the interviews and I was way better at the actual work <laughs> uh, to the degree that I, I've gotten rejected by firms after I've worked for them. Um, <laughs> very, very bizarre um, background, but I think it took me a while. I think I got lucky like breaking into McKinsey and then I only got good at interviews later basically by helping other people, um, helping other people, one, tell their story to understand themselves better. And really trying to break into consulting is really a reflection exercise because at the end of the day, you need a story and only good stories only come from you understanding what you're good at, how that fits in with organizations and being able to explain that in like an energizing, convincing, optimistic way. Um, what are some of the exercises you do to help people figure out what they're good at? Because what I see, I've, I've helped people break into consulting um, and I've had many people come to me looking for feedback and they'll be like, I want to work in McKinsey because McKinsey is the top firm in the country and they're really good with their clients. I'm like, well, what are you good at? They're like, well, I like problem solving and I like uh, business. It's like, okay, that doesn't tell me anything about you. What are you actually good at and how do you know and how can you prove it? So what are some of the questions you use to like dig that out from people? Hmm. So a couple of things I, I always like to do is, so the way that our program is structured and the same way that I used to help people when I was the only coach. So same thing is like the why again, I keep emphasizing this, but the why is so important. And it's actually part of our, our, our program nowadays is that I always have to make sure that people have the why before they even get into our program. Because actually, we end up rejecting like 70% of the people who apply to work with us because a lot of the reasons why is that they don't have a strong why. I don't want them to go and say, oh, I just want a salary. Well, if you want a better salary per hour, there are better jobs you can get out there that will earn you more per hour. Because if you think about true. all the <laughs> mental stress and things you do have for consulting, it's a different equation. But the question I always ask is a couple of things is, what's the job that you want after consulting? So even if you decide that you want to stay as a partner and become the CEO of McKinsey, for example, you still need to answer the question of what do you want to do after? And second is what skills do you want to learn in consulting that will enable you to do that? So for example, if your goal is eventually to start your own business and learning that business acumen is going to be great, then we understand your motivation for wanting to do it. And then take a step, step further is three is what worries do you have in terms of being able to get to the offer? And this is where people start getting vulnerable and they'll say, well, Davis, I think my biggest worries are, will I be able to keep up with the pace of work? Will I be able to learn the business acumen? And you'll, they'll find out a lot of these things are learnable, but I really want to get them to be vulnerable about why are they going to consulting? Because I don't want, to me, success isn't just getting the offer, but it's having a successful career. Because my my least favorite story, and luckily we don't have any of these, is that someone gets in and then they either get fired or they realize that consulting is not for them. Because I want to be able to not just put you into this program, but be able to make sure that consulting is the right path for you. And that's like the first path that we always take. And then after that, of course, we do the assessment about what your strengths are. And then part of our program, we give you a rubric about how firms like McKinsey and BCG grade applicants on it. And we figure out with your with your coach, how do you actually, where do you go? Like, for example, can you demonstrate leadership skills? Where can you demonstrate problem solving skills and so forth? And we do that the whole process. Same with the case interview is, can you think like consulting? Are you a great communicator, but you're just lacking on your math? Or are you just really good with brainstorming? But for some reason, you just cannot read a graph to save your life. 
So we will tailor the program around that, but it really starts with understanding what you mentioned, Paul, which is what's the why and what do you bring to consulting? I'm direct with people. I think it's obvious why people want to work for these companies. The opportunities in these firms are amazing to work for. Um, And that's often a driving force. People want to work for impressive companies. People want to have status. But it's like, yes, and you like have to have some other um, thing that will drive you. Because like you said, you'll just burn out in these jobs. Um, So many people I worked with leave after like a year or two just because it's not what they want to really be doing. I loved the work. Um, And part of why I became self-employed is so I could like just keep doing freelancing and consulting, but like less hours so I could sustain it over a longer period. I just didn't want to do it 60 to 80 hours a week. <laughs> exactly. That's why the motivation is so good, right? It's like if someone tells me I want it for the salary and I'm like, well, these are all other opportunities that will pay you more and you work less. You should probably apply for these and they have higher acceptance rates. And if it's like the prestige, I'm like, yeah, it's prestige, but there are other companies that even have bigger prestige. They've been around longer. And again, you're going to work less hours because like really people need to have those principles because if it's, there's just so many ways that, a consulting firm will be not a really good fit for everyone. It's like, I do, I think it's an amazing career and I love the fact that I won it. Yes. But I recommend it to every single person. No, like I wouldn't recommend it to my little brother. I don't recommend it to my girlfriend. I don't recommend consulting to everyone because it's just, there are certain personality and certain type that will thrive and enjoy it. And I want to be able to get those people to encourage them to apply for something. But everyone else is just, if you're just doing it for the prestige, there are much better ways to spend your time. In running my consulting offer, what are some of the consulting skills or tools or mindsets that you use? So many, but I, I was just emailing the former office head for Bain who about this, but I'll, I'll talk about it from an external point of view and an internal point of view. So external is like, what our clients and our users feel about us? And then internally, some of the things that we solve as well that I work on. So externally, the thing at Bain is and you see this on the Bain website, it's always client results. And that's how we measure success. So yes, there's profits, revenues, and things like that. But really, the number that we're most proud of is our success rate and how many offers we're able to get. And in fact, yes, you don't take my word for it, just go on our reviews page. But we want people to be so happy with us that they're willing to be on camera and saying publicly, not do text or anything like that, but literally you're posting a video of yourself saying, oh my gosh, I love working with Michael Sultan. I love working with David and his team. And that's how we measure success is what's the client results. But it goes a step beyond that, which is that we also check in to make sure that they're doing well six months in, a year in, two years in to see how they're going. Because again, going back to it, it's not just me getting you to work, but if you quit after six months and I failed you in some way, either it was not the right career path or two, we didn't really think, teach you how to think like a consultant. And so that's the, the mindset there for the external. And internally, the same thing is that for me, it's almost... When I think about the teams I've hired at my consulting offer, or even at Jump Cut, or even the interns I trained at Bain, it's almost like you want to surround yourself with people who are driven and care. And so the two principles from consulting is always, one is making sure we solve on the right problem, which we talked about throughout the, the last hour, is I always want to make sure the team, yes, yeah, so we could do a hundred different things. So we actually have an Excel sheet. Uh, we call it ideas for later. And it's literally like when you get inspired, put it on the sheet. And if you still feel inspired, in 72 hours, we can start implementing some of this stuff. But it's like we have so many different ideas, but it's like the more ideas you work on, the more slow you, the slower you become. And eventually you get overwhelmed and you overwork. So I want to prevent that for the team because, again, it's about the marathon. It's not about trying to get every single ounce out of them within the next six months. And that's one. And then internal, second one of consulting is you always presume trust on your consulting team. When somebody makes a certain decision, for example, when the manager decides to cut your section of the presentation to save time for the client, if someone uses a data source, but you didn't know about it, you always presume trust. And that's something that we always do on our team as well at my consulting offers. I always presume trust. So if someone did something a certain way or made a certain decision or decided to, for example, let's say get a, a, a different SaaS company than the one I'm used to doing and try to change the contract when they're in charge of it, I always, instead of going in and, and the whole big corporation, like, hey, why'd you do that? We always work with this contractor. Why'd you do that? It's like the whole presumed trust. I was like, oh, yeah, I noticed that we switched from Sarah to Paul. 
as a well, love to hear your experience. What uh, what do you like about Paul Barrett and Sarah that we're outsourcing this type of a function for our bookkeeping, for example, to to Paul now? And then usually they have an amazing reason on how to do it. And I think that's a great mark of a team because if the team is just doing the same thing over and over again because they don't want to get into conflicts, they don't want to stir the pot, then you have the wrong people on board because even though when I left Bain, I wanted to continue to work around people. And that's why our team is, they're not all former consultants, but a lot of them come from McKinsey, Bain, BCG because of that reason. Yeah, how many people do you have now? Yeah, so in total, if you count like all our coaches and part-time and everything else, we have 50 people, but day-to-day, we have a full-time as of this recording, we have 10 people who are full-time. This is probably a learning curve for you as well. Um, talk to me about, you You talked about, okay, here's our success and we are, we're very focused on happy people who get placed at high rates and stay at those companies and are happy with their careers. How do you like instill that culture in the company? Like I think Bain is a great example of this because of any of the consulting firms, Bain has like the most hardcore culture. Like people love working there. And <laughs> they're it, always it, like above and beyond BCG and McKinsey when it comes to like culture ratings and <laughs> like glass door <laughs> rankings. And um, yeah, so what do you know about consulting or culture from your time at Bain? How are you thinking about implementing that? Um, how do you think about an organization with these things? Yeah, so when it comes to working at Bain and working with all the firms, the things I learned about culture is it really comes down to a few things, which is you as and this is more talking to anyone who's watching this who wants to be an entrepreneur or a manager of your team, is that it's going to come down to you and it's going to come down to the person driving it. So I'll give you an example is that I, I say I, I sell this idea that if you look at our glass door for my consulting offer, I'm so glad I have 100 percent approval rating and people are happy. But I'm going to tell you what people don't hear about. And this is like me being completely open about this, too, is that it took a lot of work as in like I'll, I'll talk about it from myself point of view, but also from the company's point of view is from myself is I learned, I made a lot of mistakes and I still make a lot of mistakes. Oh, give me a second here. It looks like someone's trying to buzz in downstairs. Is I still make a ton of mistakes. Like I get open feedback. So I'll give you one instance that just happened last week. So I, we have a channel and I'll tell you the history of it. It's called the love channel. So what the love channel is, is that it's anytime someone does something well, you want to give them a praise. Like for example, hey, today I want to give Peggy a, a shout out because Peggy helped me out with this with this assignment that I could have done on my own or Peggy reorganized all our folders so things are really easy to find. And the history of it was that in the beginning, nowadays we get a couple of messages every single day, people giving shout outs. But before it was just me, like for the first year of the company, it's just literally Davis say, shout out to Paul for crushing it today on the presentation with Berkeley. Shout out to Leah today for making sure that our servers are back online when it went down offline and things like that, right? It was just like a year of me just into the hollow. I'm like, wow, this is not working. And there's no way I, I, I can't do this. But eventually traction started happening and it worked. And this is just an example of sometimes you have to drive and change yourself. But the second thing was that last week I started giving some shout outs. And the first time it's ever happened, this is me totally being open to it. One of the team members especially back said, hey, Davis, I really appreciate the shout out there, but but I, I just don't like being publicly put. And I was like, oh, I am so sorry for that. And I asked, would it be OK for me to would it be OK for me to privately just send how much I appreciate you doing this? And she said, yeah, privately is OK. I just don't want attention. I, I just am not that first person. So I immediately deleted that post before anyone else saw it and then apologized to the person. And now starting from last week, before I give a shout out for anyone who has never given a shout out for, I started asking, is it okay for me to post this? And for anyone who was already at the company prior, I started asking a question, Hey, I've gotten this feedback that I made someone feel not uncomfortable, not as comfortable by putting their shout out in live. I have never asked you this question, but how do you feel about me putting the shout out live? And that's just part of me learning as a, a founder, as a CEO. And that's just something about Bain too. It's like you have this comfort of being able to make a mistake. And I think that's one of the great things about because all that you learn is that what's not okay is making the same mistake twice. 
But what is okay is learning from your mistakes and being able to grow from it. And that's like the same same culture that I try and instill is that people make mistakes. I'll, I'll tell you, like for example, once the the other week we were we were about to do a we were about to do a workshop and for a university and I try or the person who was building the the slides for this one first time doing it and they put the logo of the rival school in. I'm like, so how are we going to prevent this from happening before? Well, obviously, I had checks and balances in, so I got you. They're like, oh, Davis, I think what I should do next time is instead of just Googling the first name that comes up, and maybe it's like the rival school, and that's why it's pulled up from Wikipedia, I should probably double check a source. I was like, yeah, I think that's a good one. So let's do that, right? So it's like that encouragement <laughs> of learning culture, and it happens. Yeah. You know, it's like someone who is fresh out of school. This is their, this is her first job. And it's, uh, it's like totally encouraging of this. So that's just some of the things that I I think about when, when I'm building this culture where you can fail because I lead by example. And every time I fail, I will literally publicly apologize in our Slack about some things that I didn't do. Or, or sorry, I didn't do properly the first time yeah. and how I figure, figure out it. But the owning that's great. Far, right? I love that. What are the differences between... Uh, It'd be interesting to dive in. What are the differences between like Bain, BCG, and McKinsey and the types of people that they're looking for? Like my my knowledge is probably a little outdated. I think like McKinsey in my mind is obsessed with communication. Um, BCG, I think is a little more analytical. Um, like it's like a nerdier academic vibe. <laughs> that, that was my experience at the firm. It, it ranges in geography and um, office to office, but what, what do you see from, uh, these companies now in terms of what they're looking for? (laughs) Absolutely. So I can send, I actually, funny enough, I have like a one hour video on this and how to explain all of this, but we'll we'll hear for an hour if I do that. So I'll give a high level summary, but anyone who's interested, if you just go to my consulting offer website, we actually have a, a couple of blog posts on this as well that we'll talk about the differences of it. But, but the funny example, high level, it, it is similar to what you mentioned, Paul, is if you think about all the different firms. The first thing I'm going to say is if you're trying to get into consulting, realize that if your goal is to learn, to grow, and to have this professional mentorship and this coaching, all the major firms will do this. Because again, you are the main asset to them is the people. So their incentive is to train people. It doesn't look good when you're at a client and you make a, make a mistake. So they all the big firms will train you and give you proper training. That being said, the culture is very different. It's similar to universities, right? You could be an economics major in a lot of universities, but the culture is going to be different. And when you look at particularly at Bain, McKinsey, and BCG, and this is how I kind of kind of categorize it, and you can kind of see why it is. So McKinsey was the first consulting firm to be created out of the big three. And for them, you can almost think of them as this is like the older brother who is going to Harvard. He is he he feels that he is right most of the time because he's older, has more experience and he knows what is best and that is pretty much what you happens when you go into a a pitch between let's say ge wanting to work with mckinsey bain bcg and that's usually one of the pitches that mckinsey will make is we've been doing this longer than bain and bcg and that's like reflected in that culture right so when you go into mckinsey you get this whole database of knowledge that's been accumulated since the founding of the firm which you don't find at bain and bcg to that same level of depth so that is like the mckinsey was like We've done this before, and that's why communication is also important, is that there's a lot of information. They created the pyramid principle, and it's like, that is what I think about McKinsey, is you can think about the older brother who is there. Then you have a BCG, which came up afterwards, and BCG, think of it as the second oldest brother, and this voter is like the one who goes to MIT, maybe goes to Carnegie Mellon, goes to tech school, and it's like very engineering focused, and because he's very analytically rigorous. So unlike, unlike McKinsey, BCG believes that, yes, you can draw from past knowledge, but every situation is unique. So your framework and how they approach every pitch is this is the unique thing that we built for you. And you got to see this in a lot of ways. For example, BCG started two things that other firms are still trying to catch up. One is the Henderson Institute, named after Bruce Henderson, who's their founder. And it's all about researching new frameworks, researching new white papers, like literally investing in a separate company to go in and do the research. And then you have BCG Digital and Digital BCG, and that itself hasn't existed 
now does in McKinsey and Bain. Yeah. But you have like BCG driving the sports. They're like, we're going to get ahead of the market instead of relying on what we know. We're going to push the boundaries of analytical honesty and figure out what can be done rigorously from an analytical point of view. So that's that. Yeah, I, th- I think I'll add to this. This is interesting to hear it uh, from your perspective too. I think I went from B- McKinsey where like it re- they really do obsess over communication and the pyramid principle. So your first week, you're learning how to write memos. You're not even doing like slides. So then you take the memos and writing and turn it into slides. Um, and you're obsessed with like, how do you create the most compelling, persuasive version of a story that is like backed by data? Then I go to BCG and like, I see these slides with like so much data and analysis on it. I'm like, w- like every bone in my body, like being trained by the McKinsey culture is like, oh my God, what is the, what is the takeaway here? Why, <laughs> why so much information? But I think it's, it's true what you're saying. And I would actually push back a little, like, I think the digital ventures and the Henderson Institute, they're not as central. Um, to the BCG methodology, as you think, but they're downstream of another thing that makes BCG different, which is that each of the offices have a lot of autonomy over how they're run. Like the Boston office might be run completely different than the New York office, whereas like McKinsey is much more consistent uh, across the offices. Across geography, there's more of a difference, but yeah, that that was interesting. So I'd I'd love to hear like how those two compare to Bain. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to add another point. So in case anyone's never seen a McKinsey, a Bain or BCG slide. So there's a lot of them publicly. For example, BCG works a lot with the city of Dallas. So you can go ahead and look up any of the BCG because their government, they'll post it online. One of my favorites is you can see what Paul mentioned by just saying there's like one just called BCG Dallas dog problems. And you can see how much information is just on a slide. (laughs) And then you can compare it to the work that McKinsey does with, let's say, with Andrew Cuomo and the New York state government there airs. Yeah, I would go there and you can see the contrast, right? It's like McKinsey's like, what's the takeaway? If I if the CEO looked at this for five seconds, what's the insight? Yeah. Versus BGJ's like, all right, yes, well, there's the insight, but have we factually backed this up to the point where no one's gonna question that we didn't do the analysis? So it's like really that, right? And it, it transitions nicely into the Bain example, which is that, and for Bain, if anyone's curious, you can look at the work that they do for a lot of pro bonos as well. And notice that's online, so see the slides. Bain is the youngest brother and the entrepreneurial of the one. And I'll tell you why it's entrepreneurial in a bit. Is that because Bain is the smallest, they also spend the least on infrastructure. So for example, at McKinsey, you literally have a team that helps you build your slides to do your research to help, right? And BCG is like in the middle of that where you still have your knowledge centers and so forth. But Bain is like pretty much you're driven on your own. And I remember one time we were on a case that was one of the most important cases for the San Francisco office. And our knowledge expert was dealing with 11 other cases at the time. So you can imagine I get like two hours of our time per week. And so I was like, wow, that's not work. And the reason for it is that Bain encourages this lean model of how to work. And you can see this in multiple ways. You can see this in the way that the slides are made. It's like you look at the McKinsey slides and the BCG slides, there's a certain format. You look at the Bain slides, like, all right, well, let's keep it local to the case and let's keep it to the team. And a lot of times the data doesn't just come from me emailing someone to find it. It's like, I have to actually go out and find it. So I'll tip, my oh, favorite wow. example of this is that one time I, back in San Francisco, when I was living, my roommate was working at McKinsey at the time. And so we both found out, and it's very obvious we were about the client site. We're on the same client and different teams because her, the person she was reporting to on their client was former McKinsey. Ours was former Bain. So they used the team that they liked. But we were doing parallel, we were doing parallel projects in that this biotech company was trying to launch two different drugs with two different teams led by the respective heads. And for her, one of the things that she wanted to be able to do was to figure out a competitor analysis on how big the sales team was for the another biotech company that was selling a similar drug. And so she just basically emailed the support for McKinsey and then in the morning, she had the information. And so what one of my team members who were doing parallel scenes with Duke had to do was he went on Google Maps for the manufacturing. So he had to figure out for the manufacturing footprint. And he went to Google Maps and went to Google Earth and zoomed in on the parking lot and tried to figure out how many cars there were and it looked like how many 
parking spaces were occupied to try to figure out what that data point was. And that speaks to the scrappiness and entrepreneurial drive of Bay, but also at the same time, the fact that there's not as much resources that you could rely on. Yeah. So one other interesting thing, and I talked about this in my BCG versus McKinsey video. McKinsey talks about Bain and McKin and BCG zero. Like nobody talks about that. <laughs> uh, at BCG, they talk about McKinsey all the time. They're always like, what is McKinsey doing? What it, and they don't talk about Bain. Uh, does Bain talk about the other firms? <laughs> Bain definitely does. It's like the same thing, right? Older brother doesn't care. It's like he's right. Middle brother is like, all right, I got to prove it. We got to prove that the older brother is not always right all the time. And the younger brother is like, hey, I got to prove I'm right about both of you. So a lot of time, yeah. So we, uh, at Bain, you do get to see exposure from the other firms. Like it comes down from any point of your experience. Like for example, from the beginning, when you get your offer, we talked about how many offers did we win from Bain versus BCG if they had a cross offer between two firms they're choosing from to the middle part where we're in a... A pitch competition to get a client you get these updates about how many percentage we win against these firms to like even when you leave they'll even say hey we have an alumni network we want to support you and so we do this better than Bain and BCG or McKinsey and BCG and that's just part of the culture and I think that is the way you look at it is like who do you feel like you need to be able to benchmark against and that's like the going back to the, the three elements is like the little brother who has a lot to prove Versus the older brother who has been there and has done that. Yeah. And how, how are you thinking about your business? Is it something, are you connected to these firms? Um, are they coming to you and being like, oh my God, the pipeline of talent you're giving us is amazing. Like, <laughs> I'd imagine you're adding a ton more value than you're actually capturing. <laughs> that's to be the goal right the goal like, in the consulting you learned of anything is that the value that you create for the people you work with should be exceeding the cost of them working with you short answer is that we're slowly continuing to build relationships so we keep in touch with the firms every single month to know trends in hiring trends in how they're doing their interview process and so forth so that's one reason why we're ahead of everyone when it comes to like blog posts it's like wait why is my consulting off the only one with this blog post stuff it's the same idea is that we're staying in touch with all of the firms not just Bain McKinsey BCG but even call it your tier twos and your boutiques as well because we want to be able to do that and one of the things that we're pushing out right now actually is slowly over time is we're going to start doing more joint events with the firms as well so for example one of the ideas we have so we haven't been able to do the plan was to do it during 2020, but obviously COVID threw a lot of things on, on our wrenches there. But one of the plans that we have in the short term is to be able to host close events with firms. Like, for example, let's say that a firm was planning on hiring for a particular office that they need. And we have, let's say they want to target women, we would do a event with them. And that's pretty much the 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 roadmap for it. But the, the goal is that we want to be able to make this industry transparent in terms of how the hiring works. And so that people know that they don't need to go to a Yale to be able to have this dream, but also to know like upfront, this is what consulting is like, this is what you would be expected to have. So if it's not for you, no hard feelings, but it's, we want to make sure to serve that population. But there, there's a lot of, of it, so we love it. So sometimes, for example, last year when BCG was doing a hiring push, definitely a lot of the BCG people we have there reach out, like, hey, do you have any candidates for this and that? Do you have any women who are, can apply for this and that and so forth? And so it's, it's something that I will say was earned over time versus something that just happened overnight. And it's like definitely definitely a, a, a signal that the people who we send to these firms are staying there longer. And the joke some of the alums have for us is like, they just want to make partner. We'll see if we can get all the talent here. I was like, well, see you. Yes, I want you to be partner. That would be fantastic, but you should be partner for yourself. And we'll uh, see you in a few years when you are. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's something I experienced. I advised an undergrad group at my consulting, um, at my alma mater. Um, and I'm pumped to admit, like, we've now had at least five people break into the top awesome. three firms. Um, but once we broke a couple in, we, we had somebody at Bain, actually, and they he was an intern. And they were like, he's the best person. Why are we not recruiting at UConn? <laughs> um, so then they started coming to us and saying like, all right, send us like one person every year. <laughs> um, and I think the the lesson, the reason I share that is uh, these firms are desperate for broader talent. They've grown incredibly. When I started working at McKinsey in 08, I think they were like 10,000 people. Now they're like 30,000 people. 
and still growing at the same rates, uh, they literally can't hire enough good people every year. So it gets harder and harder for them and they really need to uh, expand their pools, but they don't want to lower their qualities, which is why places like you are super helpful in all these consulting groups from around the world. I believe so as well. It's like the same thing, right? Is it only takes one person to make a difference. And that's what we see that a lot in our community as well. So we work so much, like a, dis- a disproportionate number of people we work with are from what you like non-target schools who normally don't go, but once they get in there and I see this, and this is where a lot of the, one of my happiest moments is that we'll have someone, let's say, who goes to University of Dallas, or we'll have someone who, for example, goes to BYU in an office that doesn't recruit from BYU normally. And then they go in there, they do their internship, and it's amazing. And the, the, the thing I always challenge them is like, if you believe that this was a great internship and you want more of your classmates and even students who have not, even matriculated yet to do it, like crush it in the internship and then offer to be an ambassador to come back to campuses because you're helping the recruiting team already. Yeah. Because at the very, at the best, they have another school that they can edge out and meet their hiring needs. And at worst, they have someone promoting it for them for interest. And so there's no lose-lose for anyone. And I think that's it. It just takes like one person from any school to go in, make a huge difference. And then you have an entire pipeline built. Awesome. Well, I appreciate this uh, conversation. I am pumped by what you're doing because you're helping the underdogs like me uh, break into these firms. Uh, MyConsultingOffer.com. You can find out more down there. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) Anything else you want to leave us with, Davis? No, anytime. Feel free to email me out. And anytime, I'm always happy to chat. The question is anyone who's thinking about going to consulting for them or prep materials or whatever it is, feel free to send me an email. It's davis at myconsultingoffer.org. Just send me an email. I'm pretty active on it. Or my LinkedIn, just reach out or Paul can connect us. It's just, Lisa, super honored. And I love what you're doing. And I already said this already. It's like, I love watching the videos on the strategy you <laughs> channel because it's like, you're tackling the questions that people should be tackling. And it's like, you're super honest and super Upfront. like other people like they sell this vision of because all these like oh a dream job for everyone it's like a great job but is it for everyone no and is and is it going to change your life yes but also think about the things that you trade off as a part of it and i think you're doing a great job at that and i think there needs to be more transparency into the industry yes yeah, so bay mckinsey bcg don't promote that this is an amazing job and it is but also amazing is different for different people <laughs>